Hi, this is Tom Harper with Avidyne, and today we're going to talk about the Avidyne IFD 440, and specifically IFD 440 Basics, the basic operation of the IFD 440. There's about six lessons in the Basics program, and then we have an IFD 440 Advanced and Power User, and all of these lessons come directly out of the book flying with the Avidyne IFD and specifically we've made a, a IFD 440 specific version now that's available on Amazon.com so I encourage you to check that out and so these lessons will pretty much follow chapter by chapter so there's the IFD version that covers the it basically all the images have five series IFD 550 or 540 I should say and then uh, the IFD 440 version and if you want, you can follow along on the IFD Trainer app. And again, the books are available. Both of the books are available on Amazon.com. These lessons were originally written by the late Michael F. Bauer. He was a longtime regional airline pilot and, and manager of, of training for regional airlines, the CFI. And uh, he owned an IFD in and, and his 182, his personal airplane, and contacted me originally to... He wanted to know if he was okay to use the uh, IFD trainer to make this book. And he went off and wrote it, and we really liked it. And uh, we've licensed that from him and now his family. And uh, he's since passed away tragically from cancer. And, and uh, But a great guy, smart guy, and we want to honor him by continuing to share his lessons that really help bring to life the uh, IFD series in a scenario-based format. Again, I mentioned the, the IFD trainer is available for the iPad. It's a free download. We use actual certified code, so it behaves like the uh, panel-mounted unit. So it thinks it's a panel-mounted IFD. Uh, again, downloadable. It'll emulate any of the six IFD models. Today, we're going to focus specifically on the IFD 440, as you see here. So let's start with uh, the first lesson, uh, it's basic product description overview. As I mentioned, there are six different models of IFD. Again, we're going to focus on the IFD 440, which is an FMS GPS Navcom. It's got synthetic vision, Bluetooth Wi-Fi, forward-looking terrain alerting. Uh, since it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in, there's a Bluetooth keyboard that comes with it. And you can download for free the IFD 100 app, which is a different app than the trainer. And we'll talk about that. You can see the five series units. Uh, have some radio and video, uh, radar and video options. And the IFD 550 and 545 have uh, a, an attitude reference sensor uh, integrated, which is nice, which will give you this first person synthetic vision and attitude display. But we're going to focus today on the 440. As with all the IFDs, the IFD 440 features a hybrid touch user interface. That means it has a touch screen, but it also keeps the knobs and buttons that we're all used to. So it gives you the best of both. So pretty much anything you can do on the knobs and buttons, you can do on touch and vice versa, with some exceptions. We have a page and tab user interface. That means it's a flat menuing system. There's no home page. There's no nested menus unfamiliar icons. Everything's plainly labeled. Here we've got three pages and the two tabs, and you can get to any page in one or two clicks. Geofill makes data entry easier uh, by helping suggest waypoints based on where you're at, where you're going, and uh, as you enter keys it'll nominate waypoints, making it much faster for data entry. Less head downtime. Synthetic vision is standard. We've got built-in 3D synthetic vision that includes terrain, 3D obstacles, 3D traffic, uh, METAR flags. Really looks nice on the map. Gives you an additional situational awareness. The terrain awareness and forward-looking terrain alerting is basically a, a certified TAWS function without the certification. And we have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are integrated into the box at no additional charge. So that gives us access not only to the Avidyne uh, IFD 100 app, but also a bunch of third-party apps. 
The 440 is a pen for pen replacement for the GNS 430 and 430W. So if you have a W, we obviously you want to get to a WAS antenna and WAS coax. So that would change, but it uses the same connector, the same trays, and the same wiring. And again, there are some exceptions and caveats to the wiring. There are extra features in the IFD 440, including the ability to monitor the standby comm frequency and also uh, the terrain alerting audio feature, which wasn't in the GNS430 series. So uh, it would just require extra wires up to, to the audio panel. And if you're using an existing Garmin ADSB transponder, the way it wires into the 430 is slightly different than the way it wires into a 440. So that wire would just need to move from one pin to another. Other than that, it's pin for pin. And, and literally, you could go in and, in the morning, drop your plane off at 10 in the morning, and, and fly away after lunch. Uh, the paperwork takes more time than the install. So it significantly reduces installation time for you. And here's just a head-up comparison with, if you have a 430 today, what you'd get with a 440. We've got our actual FMS type user interface. So that means if you're in a flight school and you're training to move up to the air transport or corporate category aircraft that have real FMS units, you're going to be very familiar having trained on a 440. Of course, GPS, nav, and comm, and that's pretty much where it stops there. Uh, we've got hybrid touch. There's no touch screen on the for GNS series. We got synthetic vision built in. There's no synthetic vision in the GNS series. You're going to get color contoured terrain base map, which is, wasn't available on the GNS. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and uh, the FLTA features are all built in. There is an option for Bluetooth with a flight stream 210 on the 430, which if you have one a 210 today with your 430 and you're upgrading to a 440, you can uh, sell the 210 with it. Uh, we won't need it for the IFD 440. And then the Bluetooth keyboard comes with all the IFDs and the IFD 100 app. There's nothing like that on the 430. We also work with ForeFlight and a bunch of other third-party apps. Jeppesen approach charts and airport diagrams, we show those on the IFD 100 app. So we'll jump on to Chapter 2 here, which is knobs and button functions. Let's you see here. So going around the bezel here, this upper left knob is the radio volume and squelch button. So you just push and twist for squelch, and then a little volume bar will show up here when you're selecting volume. If you push and hold the button for four seconds, it will power the unit down. There is a countdown timer on the screen. There's your flip-flop, your frequency transfer, and you need to push the button to flip-flop. There's three line select keys and they will vary based on what page you're on. They are context sensitive. So right now it's uh, we're on the map page. Uh, so you can either touch the button or touch the screen to activate those functions. The left dual concentric knob is for tuning the comm and the nav. So right now the comm frequencies are displayed. If you want to see the nav frequencies, push in on the button and it'll switch them to nav. And then you can just twist to tune. We'll talk about tuning specifically later. There's three page function buttons on the 440. Here's uh, where the USB port is. This is where you can upload your nav data, your databases, uh, download the logs, uh, save uh, flight plans and transfer them to another uh, airplane or your user preferences. So you can, if you want fleet commonality or something like that, the right Dual concentric knob is a context sensitive knob. I call it the FMS knob, but it also manages the range. So zooming in and out when you're on a map page, you can still pinch zoom, etc., with the touch screen. But that's your that's the knob you'll use the most, I think. Uh, then you've got your enter and your clear, which are self-explanatory. Your procedure button, very much like you're used to on a 430. Your direct two, same way it operates like any of the navigators. And then your CDI knob, which is controls whether you're navigating via GPS or you're dead going to the V-lock to the nav radio, if you just want to fly to a VOR or an ILS. And then there's OBS mode as well. So we'll show you that in the lessons. It's covered in the book as well. The page and tab user interface I mentioned over on the left here, we have the 
we are on the FMS page and we happen to be on the flight plan tab. So again, this two-way rocker switch is here. I can move between each of the tabs by just pushing on the left or right side of the knot of this two-way rocker. Or I can reach up and just touch any of these. And I'll show you this in, on a live demo on the, using the trainer. And then over here, I've switched to the map page. And now again, I'm on the TAWS tab. So I've got the 3D synthetic vision showing up. There's another set of tabs on s several of the pages. One of them is the flight plan plus map. And you'll notice we call it a side tab. So if you're on the FMS page and on the flight plan tab, there's this side tab called map. And if you touch it, it'll open up and you'll have map plus flight plan. So you'll still see an abbreviated list of your flight plan. And this is a great page for building your flight plans because you can see a preview right on the screen as you build it. And we'll go through that on the live demo. If you push the tab again, it'll, it'll go back to a full FMS page with just your flight plan waypoints. And again, because it's hybrid touch, you can either touch the tab or you can push and hold the left or right side of this button and it'll retract that, that tab or extra, or, or, uh, bring it back. If you go to the FMS nearest tab, so it's the tab all the way to the right here, that'll get you your nearest search function. So if you want to find the nearest airport in the event of emergency, just go FMS nearest and you'll get there in two clicks. And this is what the nearest airport page looks like. And it's got your frequencies and radial distance to uh, that particular waypoint, the name, the name of the airport. There's an info blue circle here. If you touch it or move the cursor over it and enter, uh, it'll take you to the info tab and give you all the information about that particular waypoint, in this case, airport. Uh, if you push and hold the side tab, if you touch it, it'll, it'll open up. And now you can see the map plus the nearest airports. And if you, as you scroll through the list of nearest airports, you'll see this blue circle, this cyan circle here. That will dance around and highlight each of those nearest airports. Uh, so it gives you a quick visual cue as to where they are instead of kind of computing with radial and distance. Uh, sometimes in an emergency, the nearest airport might not be the best option. If, if there's one right off the nose that's a farther and you have the altitude, maybe not having to execute that turn will save you some altitude and make sure you get there. But this will give you a visual cue really quickly. So again, push and hold the FMS button and this will extend back out or retract. And while we're here, if you cycle through the line select key number three, it's right now it's nearest airports. If you push it, it'll go to nearest airports at your destination, VORs, MBBs, and so forth. So it'll give you a list of all of those uh, nearest searches as you cycle through this line select key here. Uh, Geofill, I mentioned earlier, that's the algorithm that we developed and patented that de predicts the intended identifier based on its proximity to your reference point and the facility type that, that you're looking for, and it's context aware. So that's really important. If you're doing a direct to and you start, start typing in a letter, uh, it's going to be in proximity to your aircraft position. And if you're building a flight plan, it'll be in proximity to the previous fix. It's doing a geographical search rather than an alphabetic search like the old legacy navigators where you always had K and then you'd go A, B, C, D. Well, here's an example here. I'm flying along and I need to enter the Hancock VOR. I'm flying up the East Coast. If I spin around and type in H on a GNS 430, it's going to ask me, do you want this uh, VOR that's 50 miles away or do you want the uh, HM Haneda NDB in Japan. Well, you know, I'm in a single engine piston airplane flying up the East Coast. I doubt I need Japan. The geofill allows me to bypass a few extra keystroke steps and provide the more obvious choices. In this case, it'll nominate Hancock. You could still put HM if you want, but we're going to nominate HN. Even though HM is alphabetically the first one, it's not the most logical one geographically. And as we go through the demonstration, you'll see a geofill in action. And you'll rarely have to spell out an entire waypoint. It's going to nominate the correct one you want within one or two keystrokes in most cases. It's pretty amazing. 
One of the cool features on the IFD is what we call the IFD source state, and that always tells you what source state the navigator is in based on wherever you're at. So whether you're flying an in-route GPS or you're on an ILS or you're on an LNAV or an LPV or an LNAV plus V, it will always tell you so you'll know right there in the upper right corner. And that's your source state. There's also going to display transition states. So if you've got an approach loaded and you're going from a GPS en route to an LPV or a, a localizer, or an ILS, or an uh, LNAV, it'll show it is armed when that's loaded properly. And it'll be blue, cyan. That means it's armed, but the GPS is still navigating. And then once it transitions, from, in this case, from GPS to LPV, it'll switch back to that particular mode for the approach. So it's a, at a glance you can tell what's going on and you know what the navigator's thinking and what it's doing. And then another thing you want to keep in mind is there's an optional data block that we like to put up on the 440. It's up all the time on the 5 series, but on the 440 it's an optional data block. But it always tells you what mode the nav is in. In this case LPV is LPV, but it'll also tell you when you're in route mode and terminal mode and as you know, that uh, that's going to affect your CDI scaling. So it's nice to have that as a confirmation of what mode the box thinks it's in. So let's talk about tuning the radios here. It's lesson three in the book. Okay, so let's bring up the training app. Here it is. Uh, I've got it on the screen. Uh, but for the sake of... Uh, of this lesson we're going to just talk about the radios right here the nav and the com and as i mentioned uh you can just twist this knob and on the trainer i'm going to just click and drag here so i'm going to do that and again i'm running this on an ipad so i'm mirroring it onto my screen so forgive me if i um, in fact i'm going to turn on my pointer here so you can see a little better there you got the green circle here so as I do a button, I'm doing it on the iPad with my finger, but I'm going to try and mimic that with the mouse over here so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so we're going to tune the com. We'll use the left knob here. Again, the, the, the outer knob is megahertz. And so I'm spinning the knob here. The inner knob is kilohertz, and it's just kind of like your 430. You tune the, tune the frequency and flip-flop it into the active using the flip-flop button here. All right, so that's pretty straightforward. But you'll notice, as soon as I start twisting this knob, this that frequency nomination page came out. So let's twist the knob again. Give it one click. Frequency nomination page comes out. There's three different tabs you'll see across the top of it. There's an airport tab. So when you're at an origin airport, you go to that airport tab, and all the frequencies you need for that airport are going to be listed in the order that you need them. So, you know, whether you need to listen to an AWOS or uh, the ground frequency, then a, a departure frequency or a tower, uh, you can scroll through the list with the knob or you can just reach up and touch any one of those and scroll with your finger. And if you touch the, the one that's highlighted, it will move it across into the standby window. So once you take off, now you can go to the en route tab and it'll show all the uh, troll and center frequencies for your programmed route. So for center frequencies and all that. So uh, makes it easy to tune those. And then when you get within 40 miles of your destination, go back to the airport tab and all the arrival frequencies will be listed on the airport tab for you. They'll all be preloaded and nominated. So it makes it really easy to uh, keep track of where you're at. And then there's a recent tab, which is nice. It's kind of a scratch pad of all the frequencies you've tuned, whether you manually tune them or use the nomination. And that gives you ability, if you mistune or something, you can go to the recent tab and go back one to the previous frequency and double check. But by using the nomination list, you rarely have to manually tune. And by not manually tuning, there's less chance of you mistuning. So it's a really nice feature. Another way we can tune the comm is we simply just touch the standby window here. And we'll get a numeric keypad. So... If we wanted to say we tune in uh, 118.5, we don't have to put in the leading one. Let me touch it again. It timed out while I'm yapping. So we can touch the standby window. 
and I can type in 185, enter. So I only hit 185, and it, it always puts the leading one in because they're because of the frequency band, and it'll put in the trailing zeros for you, so it makes it easy. So if I want to put in 123575, I would put in 2, 3, 5, 7. And it put in the 5 because what else are you going to put there when you put an odd number in? So it's pretty smart that way, and then you just flip-flop it in. So I can use the left knobs to tune kilohertz and megahertz. I can use the nomination list, and I can use the keypad by just touching the standby window. Another way to tune a frequency, as I mentioned, if you go to the Info tab, so let's touch that. Here's our origin airport in the particular flight plan. Notice the Communications tab, so if I use the knob and scroll down, or if I, if I reach here and touch and scroll, if I touch the blue plus here, or if I hit the, the uh, FMS knob, it'll bring up a list of all the comm frequencies for my origin airport or whatever waypoint I have in that list on the Info tab. So I can come down here, and if I were to put in the clearance frequency, touch it, and touch it again, it transfers it over. And then if I'm on the nearest page, a list of nearest airports, again, I can reach up and touch or push the FMS knob for the highlighted frequency, and it'll move it across. So you can auto-tune from a lot of places, or quick-tune, I should say. Uh, it makes it really easy. If I scroll down, you can see the blue circles down here. So again, as I scroll around, you can see the nearest page highlighted graphically. It makes it really handy. So that's how you tune from the nearest page. So let's tune uh, nav frequencies. Let's, again, you can use the left knob. First thing you want to do is push in on the knob, and it'll give you the, na the, the nav frequencies here. So again, I can use kilohertz, megahertz. I spin in the inside knob, outer knob. I can use the keypad by touching the standby, and again, um, so 108, I can type in 081 for an ILS and enter, and it'll automatically load it in. Another cool feature on here, you can actually tune by putting in the identifier. If you notice the ABC, if you push the ABC and you know the identifier for a VOR, uh, let's type in M. And it nominates MSP because it's nearby, and it'll automatically put that frequency in. So that that's the frequency for Minneapolis-St. Paul VOR. And off you go. So one of the things with the FMS, when you put a VOR into the flight plan, it's going to auto-tune along your flight plan because you're flying GPS, but it's going to auto-tune the VORs for you and do the cross-check. So it's pretty smart that way. So that's why... It's okay to have the VOR frequencies uh, out of sight here because it's doing all that in the background for you, and it'll identify them in, uh, for you as well. So um, that was using, we used the left knob, we used the keypad. Uh, all from the Info tab, it's the same thing. Let's go to the Info tab here. And, of course, we're still on a comm, but if I were to come up here and let's put in MSP, there it is. I, as soon as I put the M in, it nominated MSP. Enter. Well, what do you know? It's 115.3, and that's I believe that's what it tuned a minute ago. Yep. So uh, it'll get me the frequency, and again, I can double-click it and transfer it over, uh, should I want to, off the info page. If I go to the nearest page, again, nearest, again, I can push and click on this FMS button and move across. I'm on nearest airports. If I push the button here, I'm going to go nearest to destination and then nearest VORs. Hey, look, there's MSP. If I want to tune in a different VOR, let's tune that one. We can touch it or push, push the FMS button to activate, and it will tune it across. Transfer it across. So tuning from the nearest page. And uh, so that's all the different ways to tune. Uh, one of the other things you can do, if you want to fly that nav frequency, you want to go over here to your uh, CDI knob and just give it a twist, and you'll go from GPS.
to VLOC, and now you're flying off that nav frequency that's in the active window. So that'll force the navigator to fly purely off of uh, the VHF nav. And again, if you're it's an ILS, it'll be an ILS. If it's just a VOR frequency, it'll be a VOR, of course. So if you want to go back to GPS, you can just spin the knob, and it will toggle back. We can also get into OBS mode there, and we'll talk about that in a future lesson. But um, So that's, that's how you manually tune a nav and then fly to that nav frequency. One of the other cool features is station ID readout, and you can see it here. We've got our active and our standby frequencies, and it's telling us what station it's tuning. So it's looking at the frequency, in this case, 127.9. It knows where we are geographically because of GPS position. So it goes and looks in the database. Is there a, what is the name of the station that uses 127.9 in this geographic region? And there's only one. They've thought about that. There's no conflicting frequency stations. So it'll return out of the database the name of the station that's tuned. In this case, Minneapolis Center. How many times have you gone to push to talk and you go, wash? was I talking to approach or was I talking to center? Now you know exactly who you're talking to before you go. And notice it's also decoding the standby as well, which is really handy. And one of the nice features of the VHF COM in the 440, it'll receive on both frequencies. In other words, you can transmit and receive on the active, but you can, you're can you also receiving on the standby in real time. And you'll get a little RX lighting up here when, when it's receiving and same in both windows. If you're transmitting, the TX will light up up here. But if you're receiving on the standby frequency, maybe you're listening to an AWOS or something, as it's receiving, it'll get a little uh, RX light right here in the window. Uh, and if you have it hooked to your audio panel with that additional wire, you can monitor that free, that uh, standby frequency. The Avidyne audio panel has a monitor button, but if you're using an older audio panel and you have an unused switched audio, like you're not using the ADF or the DME, you can wire it to that switched audio and relabel it, and now it becomes your comm monitor, and you can listen to the standby. So it's like having one and a half comms uh, in a single radio. So we talked about station ID readout, uh, emergency quick tune. All that is is if you push and hold the flip-flop, it's going to tune 121.5 for you. So I just push and hold it for three seconds, and boom, 121.5 comes up in the window. And that pretty much covers the VHF comm. Next up, we'll talk about basic navigation, basically how to enter a flight plan. And that's uh, Chapter 4, Lesson 4 in the book. So let's bring up our simulator again. Let me resize this so that it fits within the confines here. Okay, let's say we're sitting on the ground in Powwocky at uh, Chicago Executive, they call it now. So here's a simple flight plan. Cessna 1234, you are cleared from the Chicago Executive Airport to Oshkosh Airport via Badger VOR. Climb and maintain 4,000, squawk 4321. Uh, so when we uh, jump in the airplane, we're sitting on the ground at Chicago Executive. Uh, it'd probably look more like this. Well, one of the things we want to do is I'll show you how to set the origin if you're using a simulator. If you're using the simulator at home and you'll want to know how to do that, um, I'm just going to clear this out. So if you clear whatever is in your, in your flight plan, the first time you push the uh, FMS button, it's going to ask you to reset the origin. So that's what we'll do. We'll push enter or just touch the origin. You can push enter or push, pushing in on the FMS button is the same thing. Um, I, last place I used was Palwaukee, but here's where you can enter in whatever you want. And when you're entering in a waypoint, you can either use the big knob, little knob, like you're used to in the GNS, or if you just touch in the window, it'll bring up a QWERTY keyboard, and you can type in KPWK in this case, uh, or whatever your origin is. So there's our origin airport. Now we, we just want to go to Badger VOR, so we're going to push to the FMS knob. That'll always give us the FMS menu, and it defaults to waypoint. It kind of gives you whatever you 
the possible things you could do at this airport. Of course, there's a couple of published departures you can see. But we just want to enter a waypoint. So we push enter again, either the enter button. You can push the enter button. You can push the FMS knob or you can touch waypoint. We'll touch waypoint this time. And I, it's a nominating the nearest VOR, which in a lot of cases you're going to jump on the nearest VOR if, if it's an IFR flight plan. Uh, in this case, it's uh, Northbrook. But we want to go to BAE, so I'm just going to type in B, A, and notice it finished the E for me, so I didn't have to spell it completely, but I hit enter. So that's BAE. Now we're just going to go to Oshkosh. Very simple flight plan. So let's do the same thing. We'll push the FMS knob. We're going to go to a waypoint. And now we'll type in K. So I'm going to come up here and touch the uh, window so I get a QWERTY keyboard. And I'll type in K. Oh. And notice it nominated Osh. I didn't have to spell the whole thing out. And enter. So there's my flight plan. I can use the big knob here and scroll back to the top and have a look. And then I can, uh, if I want to look at the uh, flight plan uh, side tab, I can either push the side tab here. And now I've got a view of the flight plan. Or I can push and hold the FMS button. And it'll come back out. Let's retract it again just so we can see the map. It looks nice. Okay, so that's our flight plan plus map. The page and tab I talked about again. You can move um, through each of the pages and through each of the tabs by going left and right. Or you can reach up and touch any one of the tabs. Let's go to our map page. Push over to the map. And now you can see a full screen map. Notice you got the side tab here for data. If I pop it out, we can scroll. All right. And let's go to the TOS tab, and you can see us sitting on the runway, getting ready to roll. We haven't activated our flight plan. We haven't enabled the simulator yet, so we're just sitting here on the runway. This is kind of cool looking. Uh, we can turn the TOS, uh, the terrain alerting on and off, and we can turn the pink magenta flight plan. But, and you can have the data blocks on the uh, 3D Synvis page as well, the TOS page. So let's go back to our FMS. And let's go ahead and activate the flight plan, and we'll get flying. So I'm going to push Activate Flight Plan. Notice BAE is our active waypoint. It's in magenta. Uh, I'm going to turn the simulator on. Now, a couple of things I do on the sim real quick is, uh, for autopilot, I'm going to go in here and set the altitude before I start. And then, back on flight control, go back to follow flight plan. And then simulator, let's turn it on by hitting times one. I had it paused. And you see now it's realigned on the appropriate uh, airport uh, runway. Go back to the map. You see we're on the other runway. And now we're taking off. And now I've got the simulator running, so it's but this is it's gonna immediately try to capture the, the uh, course rather than Typically, you obviously fly out on runway heading, etc. But the simulator wants to go ahead and take off flying, so we'll let it. If I turn to the map, uh, there's my magenta line. Let's go to, I'm on the map page. Let's go ahead and turn the data blocks off for a minute. Touching the side tab here. Notice I'm in the north up orientation on my map. I'm going to hit clear this message. Uh, if I push in on, while I'm on the map page, map tab, when I push in on the FMS button, now I'm in the forward looking track up. And notice it says track right here next to the heading box. So I'm in forward look, so it's like 140 degrees, 120 degrees forward look. If I push it again, I'm in 360 degree track up mode. If I push it again, I go back to north up mode. So that's a way of setting your map orientation. And then you can declutter your map. As I mentioned, the line select keys, you can either touch right on the screen and declutter the land, political boundaries, and water, and turn them off, and then cycle back through. Again, you can use the button as well. Same with the nav data, the off-route nav data. You can de declutter 
the different levels and kind of clean up the map depending on what rain. Map plus data blocks again, push and hold the button and the data blocks come out. Again, those are scrollable, so you can have as many as you want here. It's pretty long. You can have it go quite a ways. There's a little CDI. There's you can, there's factory defaults, but you can customize those and have them whatever you want. Like in this case, I've got the active waypoint at the top, my nearest airport second, so it's always keeping track of where my nearest airport is, and my destination. So those are all handy to have. Minimum safe altitude. I've got ground speed. Etc. Notice there's a couple of data blocks across the top of the screen as well. Uh, if you don't want Zulu time up there, it's kind of handy, but if you, you could put ground speed up here since it's a one line data block, and these are both one line data blocks up here. And we get into the power user, we'll te teach you how to uh, change the data blocks, but uh, for, for this lesson, we'll stick to this. Uh, we talked about frequency tuning. Again, uh, I'm, I'm in route here, and if I click the knob, uh, now I'm in route. Chicago approach, if they hand me off uh, to 20.5, I can can't transfer it across and put it into the active window with the flip-flop. So as I'm flying along, these frequencies will update, and as I'm handing off from one center to the next necessarily, uh, it'll nominate those frequencies for me, and I can tune it. This nomination window will time out after about five or six seconds. There it goes. And again, we can clean up the map. So we talked about those. Uh, nearest search, again, if I hit FMS, nearest tab, it's going to give me all the nearest airports around where I'm at. So I can scroll through those, etc. And then nearest plus map you're looking at here. The other way is to have full nearest page. And again, if I if I have an emergency and I want to go to uh, scroll to an airport here, Kenosha Regional, uh, I can tune the frequency. It's now in the standby window, and then I can highlight the eye, little eye here. I can use the knob to do that as well. By the way, I can turn the small knob and and kind of finally move through the different boxes and then push enter and I'll get go to the info tab it'll automatically load that and I can get all the information about that airport go back to the map and we're off and flying as we go in route we can look at our TAWS tab there's our magenta line we can zoom in and out and we're off and flying so that was our simple flight plan entry Okay, we're on to lesson five, changing a flight plan. Here we are, changing a flight plan. So, so in this scenario, we want to enter a new flight plan. So let's clear the old flight plan first. So we'll go to the route tab. There's the current route we just flew in the previous lesson. So we're going to clear that by hitting the clear button. And then we'll delete, delete active route. And our new clearance is we're Cessna 1234. You are cleared from St. Paul Downtown Airport to Chicago Midway via the Press Intersection, Direct No Dean, Direct Lone Rock, Direct Madison, Direct Northbrook, Climb and Maintain 5000, Squawk 4321. So here's our flight plan along the bottom here. So let's enter that. Again, on the simulator, you can touch the black area or to push the FMS button to get the menu, but it's going to let you put in an origin. So we'll touch that, and we'll put in K, S, T, P, enter. enter. Now, if you were in the real airplane, of course, it would know where you're at because you're sitting on the tarmac receiving position, and, and it was the last place you landed. So it's going to know you're, in this case, uh, St. Paul Airport. So we're sitting on the ground at St. Paul, and I've got my simulator paused here again. Let's do that. Otherwise, it'll take off down the runway on me before I enter the flight plan. Um, so I pause the sim, and let's enter this flight plan. Now I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave the map up this time instead of you know instead of having it like this. I'll have it like this so that you can see the map as we build it out. 
So I'm going to just hold on to this knob in the airplane. I would grab this knob and I'd push in on it. And I get my menu. I push in again for waypoint. Now it's nominating MSP, which is the nearby VOR, but we don't want to go there. We're going to go to press intersection. So I'm going to touch right there and type in P R E and it nominates the rest press. So we confirm that and hit enter. Now we're going to enter ODI. So we push the button again, get the waypoint, push enter again. It nominates the nearest airport. We don't want that. We're going to type in O and it nominates ODI, no Dean. We enter. Now we want Lone Rock, so we push the button again, push it again, touch the field to get the keyboard, and enter Lone Rock, L, N, and it completes the waypoint. We hit enter. Now we're going to go to Madison, so we push in on the button. We push it again, and again we touch the field, and M. And it nominates Madison, so we only had to put the M in that time, which is nice. Now let's push the button again. This happens really fast in the airplane when you've got a knob to hang on to. Instead of I'm doing it on an iPad and trying to coordinate my mouse over here at the same time. So touch the field and type in Northbrook, which is OBK, OB, and the K will nominate. And then we're good. And now we're going to go. To Chicago Midway, so we push it again, push it again to the full waypoint, and it nominates Chicago Exec, but in this case we want KM and it nominates DW. We, we're good, and there's our flight plan. You can see our map was building out the whole time as we added waypoints. The map gave us a preview. The line select key number two, it's in the expanded mode, but if you uh, push it once, It'll take you to cursor mode. Notice it says cursor centered. So whatever waypoint you've got highlighted, it'll, high, it'll center that waypoint. So as we spin the knob and move our way up the way, flight plan, you can see we can scroll through each waypoint and double check that we've got them in the order that we want. Press, ODI. I'm turning the knob here. On Rock, Madison, Northbrook. And MDW. So that cursor view gives you a nice easy way to, to view that. So let's turn that back off. And we'll talk about compact view when we're doing airways. So now we're ready to roll. So we've uh, checked our flight plan. We're going to activate the flight plan. Hit line select key number three. Now presses our first waypoint and we can take off and get rolling. So I'm going to go up here to flight control. And again, I'm going to have to go to autopilot real quick. Well, I'm still paused. I'm just going to put an altitude in, otherwise it'll skim across the ground. Okay, we put in 5,000. Now we come back. Okay, now we'll switch back to follow flight plan. And we unpause, and off we go. And again, if we go to the map, and we go to TAS, you can see us on the runway. and We're already taken off, and we're turning on course. You can see the terrain is lit up in red. As we climb out, because within 100 feet, as we climb out, it starts turning within 1,000 feet. It'll stay yellow. Once it gets to 1,000 feet AGL, which you'll see here, our magenta line will pop in. So we take away the magenta line on the Synviz when you're within 1,000 feet of the ground. So there we go. You can see our magenta line coming in as we're getting above AGL altitude. And you can see some of the towers and obstacles lighting up there. We're in Class B airspace and we're off and running. Uh, let's go back to the map. And you can see we're in north up mode. Let's push the button to go to track up mode. There we go. Now I'm in forward view track up mode. We didn't do the frequencies, but you can get the idea. You go over here. And we can put in Minneapolis Approach and transfer that up. Okay, so now we're trucking along here. There's our first waypoint press. Now, K 
kick the simulator up to times four so we can get rolling here. So we'll come ripping along. Okay. So that we've just entered a simple flight plan and we're good to go and we've activated it. And now we're flying our flight plan. You can come over here to the pause page again. You can see the first waypoints coming in. We can again push, push the button to bring the data block out or push it again. Retract it and come back over here to the FMS. All right, I'm going to slow the sim back down to times one. All right, so now we're flying along and we get a call from ATC and they say Cessna 1234, you are cleared direct Madison. All right, so now we're going to go direct to a waypoint that's in our flight plan. So we'll show you how to do that. So we're going to, Madison, we know, is in our flight plan here. So we're just going to skip all these waypoints and go direct Madison. So we'll just scroll down using the knob. We can scroll down to Madison. There it is. We'll highlight it. So let's hit the direct to button. Since I highlighted Madison first, it'll automatically put it in the window. So now I can enter that and then activate it or hit enter again or push the, the screen here. Now we're going direct Madison as, as directed here. So now we've gone direct to a waypoint that's in our flight plane, in this can, case, uh, Madison. So now we're trucking along again, and ATC comes on the line and says, November 1234, previous traffic reports convective activity building between you and Madison. Turn left 20 degrees and proceed direct to the Volk VOR when able. So instead of going direct Madison, which is in our flight plan, it wants us to go to Volk, which is not in our flight plan. So what we can do is just hit direct. Instead of Madison, let's touch this field and type in Volk. And that's V, and it nominates VOK. So we're good to go. We hit Enter, and we activate. So now we're going direct Volk. And if we scroll up on our map with the touch screen, you can see we've got a gap in route. That's no big deal. It just you haven't told it how we're going to get back on track. All we've been cleared to so far is we're cleared to Volk, V O R, when able. So now we're flying to Volk. We're going to have to either wait for an assignment or request to uh, continue on course after that. So how do we close that gap? So let's so we call ATC as a center Cessna 1234 request direct Madison after Volk. ATC comes back and says, Cessna 1234, after Volk, you are cleared direct Madison. Okay, so now we've got a couple ways we can bridge this gap. So we're going to go all the way to Volk. Then we're, we can go direct to Madison after that. But we've got the gap here, so we've got a couple things we can do. We can either highlight the gap and clear it. But if you notice, this LSK1 is kind of our FMS butler, we call it. And it'll give you hints on things you can do. So we can just connect Volk to MSN. It's the same thing. As I can either clear the gap or I can just connect it. Let's push the button there. Now, after Volk, we're going to go to Madison. And you can see we bridged the gap in our map. So now we're happy again. And now we've closed that gap. Okay, so now we're flying along. And we get a call from center, Cessna 1234. Chicago Approach will not accept you on your current routing. After Madison... You are cleared direct Janesville, direct Northbrook as filed. So what that means is we want to insert a waypoint between Madison and Northbrook. So how do we do that? Well, that's a simple chore. We just move our cursor down between Madison and Northbrook. It's an insert cursor. Notice it's a line between the two. In the old navigators, you would highlight a waypoint, and sometimes you weren't sure when you started to add a waypoint whether it was going to go before it or after it. With the insert cursor, it's quite obvious. We push in on the FMS button. It's, we default to waypoint, so we push it again. And now we touch here on the field. We bring up the keyboard, and we type in Janesville, J-V-L, J. And notice it nominates V-L. I didn't have to enter the whole thing. Enter. We've added Janesville to our flight plan, and it shows up on the map. There it is. And now we've inserted a waypoint in our flight plan. 
All right, deleting a waypoint. Let's say we're cruising along here, and it says uh, Cessna 1234, Chicago approach has changed their minds. After Madison, you are cleared direct Northbrook as filed. So basically, we want to just take Janesville back out of the flight plan. Simply highlight Janesville by touching it or moving the cursor with the knob and hit the clear key. And now you've deleted Janesville. And now we're back to our original flight plan and off we go. So let's talk about flight planning with airways in lesson six. Okay, we've got a new flight plan here. So let's clear this flight plan. Let's go to the root tab. Again, you wouldn't do this in the airplane, but since we're using the sim, we're going to clear current route, delete the active route. Now we've got an empty slate. We've got to reset our origin. We're on the flight plan here. It's, it says to 1234, you are cleared from St. Paul Downtown Airport to Chicago Midway via the press intersection. Victor 2 to No Dean. Victor 170 to Dells. Direct Janesville. Victor 24 to Umsey. Climb and maintain 5,000, squawk 4567. So here's our flight plan now. So we want to set up our origin at St. Paul again. So let's touch in the screen here and get our menu and hit origin. And reset us back to KST. P is entered and we can... Okay, so now we're sitting on the ground. Let's get, get our simulator paused. Okay, good. And we want to enter this flight plan with the airways. So now we're going to use the button here again and put, get our menu. Push enter again. We're going to enter press. So just like we did before, we're going to type in PR. Press enter. All right. So now off of press intersection, we're going to get on the Victor 2 to the no D as our exit point. So let's push in on the FMS button. And watch what happens. Notice where it says Airways right here. And see this menu. You can see the little scroll bar. You can see that it, the, the menu extends down to here. And we're viewing this much of it with our scroll bar. So that tells me that I can scroll down beyond what I can see right here. And there's another section of menu about the same length. So let's use our knob here and scroll down. And there's look at there. Now the scroll bar says we're at the bottom of the menu. And you can see a list of airways, all of which pass through press. As you notice on the map, as I scroll through each of the Victor airways, I get a preview, an airway preview on the map. In this case, we want Victor 2. So there it is. So I'm going to select it by hitting Enter or pushing it on the knob. Now it asks for the Victor 2 exit point. Well, we want to go to Nodine. So, and you can see we've got a long menu here so let's scroll to no dean there it is i had to a couple clicks there's no dean we can either touch it or we can just push the center of the knob and now we've got notice here we've got all the waypoints between press and no dean have been loaded and it says victor 2 right here we all we had to do is select the victor airway and select the exit point and it puts in all the intermediates for us but we're not done we need to go now from um, off of Nodine, the Victor 170, to Dells. So let's push the button again, the FMS button, to get the menu. And we want to scroll down to Airways, and we're looking for Victor 170. There's 30. You can see we get a north-south. 34, 36, 129, 170. So we push in the FMS button. And we're going to go to Airways. We want Victor 170. We push Enter. And there's DLL. You can see it right there. So let's scroll. Just a little too, and too many. So you can see the preview. There it builds out DLL. We select that. And now Victor 170 has a couple of waypoints. You see from ODI to Moody to FAPCO to DLL. And it says Victor 170. Now we're going to go uh, direct Janesville, so we're going to push in the FMS button, push in Waypoint, let's select here, into the field, and type in JVL, J, and nominates J Janesville, enter. Now we're off of Janesville, we're going to go Victor 24 to Umzi. I love these names. 
Okay, so let's push the FMS button and scroll the airway down to Victor 24. There it is. You can see the preview. We approve that by hitting enter, and now we look for Umzi. Let's scroll down. There it is. And notice as I'm scrolling through, how see how it builds out the, the airway for me? All the waypoints in between, we select that. And again, here's Victor 24 and all the waypoints in between. We didn't have to manually enter all those like you would have on an old unit. And finally, we're going to put in Midway as our destination. So we push F and S, Waypoint, bring up the keyboard, and type in K, M, and DW is geofilled for us, so we have Accept. And now we've got our full flight plan with all them waypoints entered. And again, if you want, we can push the, the line select key 2 and do the cursor view and scroll through. Yep, there's press, there's main, there's troll, pegs, ODI, booty, it's all the way through. Now notice this, if I push it again, remember we talked about compacted view. I'll go ahead and bring this out on the side pan just so you can see it. But it, the nice thing with compact view, what it does is now I can look at my, my flight plan and read it back exactly the way it was given in, in ATC clearance language. So our origin is STP's uh, St. Paul Downtown Airport, direct press, Victor 2 to ODI, Victor 170 to DLL Dells, fly direct Janesville, Victor 24 to Umzi, direct Midway. So when you have it in compact mode, it takes out all the intermediate waypoints and allows you to see your exact uh, flight plan clearance. So you can read it back and it's nice, easy to read in plain English. And let's activate our flight plan. And now we're off and running. So let's go again, go to the simulator. I'm going to put an altitude in. We're cleared to 5,000, it says. So I'll just put in, switch my simulator back to follow the flight plan. And then simulator on. And now we're off and running. Again, we can go to our map page. And we can see as we're going to start taking off here. Let's zoom in with our. See, we're sitting on the runway, and off we go. And again, the simulator is not going to fly, fly one way heading. It's going to try to jump right onto the nav. Using the autopilot, you could set in a runway heading and fly vectors like you would, but we don't need to do that. So there you go. That's flying flight plans with airways. We've checked all the lessons here that we want to cover. So that completes lessons one through six, which is the IFD 440 basics. If you have any other questions, you can email us at pilotsupport at avidine.com. Tech support questions for your installer, they can go to techsupport at avidine.com. And then myself and the marketing team at marketing at avidine.com. Thank you for joining me today and have a great day.